Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Minnesota. In the NCA4, we saw some strong variation in the Minnesota outlook with excellent potential destination territory as well as high change areas emerging within the state. In the NCA5, I'm glad to say we have some more information to help us understand and prepare for these varying regional outlooks, but we're not redrawing the lines on the map here. In Minnesota, based on the research from our first video, we did correctly identify the high change boundary. And you should be glad to hear, Minneapolis and St. Paul, they are still looking very strong. This video is dedicated to Mr. Paul Rock Kretsch, whose memory is a blessing to me. If you wanna hear more about him, you can stick around to the end of the video, I'll tell you a story. Little background for this update though. When I founded American Resiliency in 2021 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. And back then, it seemed reasonable to think we'd hit 2C at mid-century. That was the consensus science. But that was then, 2023, as you know, it was a very serious year in climate. And I think we can illustrate that very well with this figure from the Copernicus Institute, which is a high credibility resource. This is an EU resource. We can see in 2023, we really jumped the shark on global heat. We had several days over two in 2023. And in 2024, in February, again, we saw days over 2C. This level of heat anomaly is not well explained by consensus climate models, and it's worth raising an alarm. This all forces us to change our thinking. I can no longer say we should get ready for 2C in 2050. What I can say is this outlook, it's the 2C modeling. It's what we'll see when the world is at 2C on average. As far as the timeline goes, we're all on this road trip together, but I think it's better to prepare sooner than later. Let's check out the challenge level for Minnesota at 2C. Just so you know where to find the source material I'm using for this modeling, the forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment. This was just updated. This fifth National Climate Assessment just dropped in November of 23. There have been significant changes in these projections, which is why I'm updating the outlooks for every state. And if you want to follow along with me, go to chapters, go down to all figures. They'll load up. They're all labeled by number, and I'll tell you the number as I'm going through it. If you go down to the bottom, you can download them all and keep them offline. I recommend doing that myself. I use the fifth national climate assessment because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. It's got some really strong models. Your tax dollars have paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to the information. As a matter of congressional mandate, though, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the national climate assessment. This made me so mad that I founded American Resiliency we're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. So let's get over to Minnesota here. Let's look at our first figure is 1.14. Here we see some national overview for changes at 2C at 1.14. Minnesota is mostly in that higher change band we see up in the north, but in the southwest corner there, you see your first evidence of the range and variation we'll be experiencing in this outlook in the state. Across Minnesota, we're expecting a total heat up of 4 to 6 degrees F. You know, a lot of people, they think they're going to be fine with climate change as long as they head north, but it's more complicated than that, as we're going to see here. In that north, we've got that higher change band. You might want to check out the Canada outlook, too, if you're interested in the north. You'll be able to find a Canada overview on the channel. The question we want to know, of course, is why is the north changing so much? Scientists are learning more about that. We're learning more about the Arctic amplification effect, why we're seeing such intense warming at the poles, and how far down that amplified warming is going to extend. This high change band here on the US overview map here, it conceals a lot of variation. And there's some of the best territory in the country, low change territory concealed in that high change band. Let's get more details and see where that comes together for Minnesota because it sure does. Here at 2.11, this lets us look at changes to the seasons, to the hot and cold extremes. And the first thing that I think when I look at this picture for Minnesota, which is a complicated picture, so we're gonna break down into little details, I am really glad, looking in the center of this image, that we don't see that dark red color on you, Minnesota. That dark red color is extreme cold loss. And we can see here, your winter, which is very precious, we're not going to see as big of loss here as we might have expected and as we have expected towards both the east and west coasts in the north. We want to talk about the summer first, though. Let's start by looking at hot days, your additional days over 95. We can already start to see the change bands lining up here. But you know, Minnesota, you're the first state where I feel like we can get such more clarity about where the boundaries lie if we put the hot days and warm nights photo together. So I'm going to put a clip up, and it's just snips out of figure 2.11. 
two SNPs side by side for your state. All right, there we go. I think you can see that nights over 70, the bands line up really clear. Additional days over 95 and nights over 70. So I just want to say this is a big change you're looking at here in the summers. In Minnesota, much of the state doesn't see a lot of days over 95 now. So when we're talking about two additional weeks of 95 a year expected down south around Wyndham, that's a big change. And you can see that in Minneapolis, you're looking at about another week over 95. And up by Duluth, you're going to get some hot days, a handful of days over 95. Look over to the right-hand side there on the warm nights, and you can see the impact another way with that heat island appearing around Minneapolis, an additional 15 to 20 nights a year over 70 projected for Minneapolis at 2C. So you can imagine that's a big additional energy expenditure in the projections for the Twin Cities in the summer. There are going to be many more folks who want air conditioning through the night in the Twin Cities, and people will want air conditioning throughout the state who haven't had it before and may not have it in their homes. Take a minute and focus in up here by Superior National Forest. You don't see additional days over 95 expected, but we are expecting a handful of warm nights, and I think that does mean that even though you're not hitting 95, it's got to be going towards the 90s during the day. Otherwise, it'd cool off at night, right? So I feel like as we look at this heat coming in, we see the lines of change forming up real clear. The first line, I see it a little bit south of Millie Lacks Lake, a little bit south of Millie Lacks Lake, right there. The second line, it's south of Duluth and north of Brainerd. Extend this line over here, extend the warm night line. If you were drawing it all the way into Wisconsin, it'd go right through Ironwood. That's your second line in the state dividing the state into three change bands. Now let's look at the cold. Let's see how those lines form up with the change bands for the cold too. All right, we're back to the big picture here on 2.11. It lets you see that this orange color here, we're talking about for most of the state of Minnesota, it's about three weeks of cold loss, three weeks less of days under freezing with some pockets up here, some pockets closer to two weeks. So that told us about cold duration, that you're going to see less cold, a shorter winter at 2C. But it doesn't tell us about intensity. And in Minnesota, the intensity of the cold is especially important. So we're looking over at figure 11.3. Let's let's just look at the plant hardiness zones. That's a measure of how cold it's going to get in the winter. But you can see this figure is as gigantic and unusable as the last one we were doing. So once more, let me get you over to some SNPs where we're going to look at changes in Minnesota from the present day climate normals to this is a 2C figure. I want you to see 3C is also readily available if you wanna look further out into the future, but I think we gotta handle 2C first. All right, looking at this snip here, do you see those lines again? I think it's kind of interesting. There's this sweet spot, here's this middle band, and that block there, that's representing Millie Lacks Lake where we were anchored before around the heat factors. In and under the arm of cold preservation extending into Wisconsin, that's the sweet spot. Relatively low summer change, relatively low winter change. That's your best balance. Up north, that cold loss, it's just a zone shift. Little less than a full zone shift in most conserved places up by the border. But you've still got two additional major factors making that area a higher change band, a harder winter change. One of them is that you got a lot of unique, cold adapted living things up in that northern band. The two... Look around Lake Superior. You can see at just a glance, this cold loss is really bad all around Lake Superior. Those are such severe winter low shifts that they say immediately to me, fire danger. And we'll look at the fire danger more in a minute. But looking down towards the south in the southern band here, you see more variation in the winter change in this southern band. Some places are looking at like a 15 degree bump up in their winter lows. The average bump is 10 degrees, some places just five degrees. This area in general, the Southern Band, you're keeping a winter, but it's not gonna be as fierce, as characteristic as your Minnesota winters of the past. In the Southern Band there, it's looking more like a Southern Iowa winter that you'd be looking at at 2C than a Minnesota winter. And you know, when I went up to Minnesota this past fall, I really, I felt these lines as I was crossing them. And let's draw them again. We've got a line right about there a line right about there. And then there's the higher change area to the north. That southern band, you got some manageable change there. There's a balance between your summer and winter change, and you've got a landscape that can handle that winter warming better than the landscape in the north. The area around Albert Lee, it feels really good there when I went through Albert Lee. 
the plants and creatures in that southern band of Minnesota, most of them, they're adapted to take a little bit of heat. They'll be okay. Good migration routes are there also for living things a bit south of there to move up, to move in. I think you could get healthy species infill with the changing climate because of the relatively mild change in where you're situated in a broader landscape and ecosystem. Minneapolis, it's worth noting, falls well in that southern band. You're looking at a manageable change outlook for Minneapolis. In that second band there, kind of centered on Brainerd, that's your sweet spot. You got good, cool summer preservation. You still got a very cold winter. It's warmer, but it's still very cold. And you have more creatures there that are more tolerant of the cold, but not super cold, not true north winter. It's not a reindeer moss ecosystem, right? You don't have your extremely Arctic adapted plants extending that far down. You have landscapes and ecosystems in the middle band that are more likely going to be able to weather the shift. On the ground, too, when I went up there, it was just beautiful passing through that middle band. It felt healthy. It looked like a healthy, moderate, cold adapted ecosystem. Totally different ecosystem than down by my neck of the woods in central Iowa. I felt the feeling of the good north healthy north emerge in that middle band, that low change band. In that upper band, the northern band, you've got a lot of cold adapted plants and creatures, very specialized living things. And over by Lake Superior especially, you can really feel the stress on the ground from the loss of cold. I always look down at the ground. It was amazing to me from my girlhood how much the ground cover had changed up by two harbors, up, up uh, north of Duluth there. The change is intense on the ground because the loss of cold it's a big stress there. Over by Lake Superior, over by Duluth, north of Duluth, where the lake is now holding more heat through the winter, you can feel the threat of fire on the ground. Anyone with eyes to see should be able to see the threat. There's too many sick trees. And in the projections, even if the days there are not projected to quite hit 95 around um, Superior National Forest, it's not supposed to be in the 90s in the summers up there. People get heat sick if they're out ricing at 90. And the loss of that deep, long, true winter cold. It's a very serious threat when you're talking about a landscape where most of your life forms, that's their advantage. Those living things are in the game because of their cold advantage. I am less concerned just from these changes we've looked at about the reservation land centered around Bemidji up by the Mississippi headwaters. You got a challenge there to be sure. It's a big change losing the cold advantage. Topping the plant hardiness zone back up there, you can see Red Lake is changing two plant hardiness zones, a 10 degree lift, but Leech Lake looks like they're changing just one zone, just a five degree lift in the winter lows around Leech Lake. And you've got the good, cool summer preservation there over in the reservation lands. If you put it together, I think you might not see the big fires there in the western part of northern Minnesota. Let's take a look. Let's peek over at the fire map. Yeah, you can see here in figure 7.4 that the fire danger is getting much worse as you get closer to the lakes. Look at that, that dark color, that's like a 10x multiplier. As we move, you know, this white, it's not modeled. It doesn't mean that it's low risk. But if we look towards that sort of Northwest territory, we're looking at more like a 3x multiplier instead of a 10x multiplier, a very different risk level. It's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of landscape management, but you might be able to keep the fire threat under control out towards Bemidji. There are a lot of rich people, they're buying up places in Duluth. I think if you wanna live in a Minnesota city that's not gonna go on fire, I'd stay down by the Twin Cities. I'd avoid the direct fire danger. I'd avoid the direct smoke inhalation danger because by Lake Superior, it's very sad to say, it's very horrible to think about, but it's hard to see how that land won't burn. Let's look at water though. Let's look at the precipitation outlook. That's important as we think about helping these changing landscape bands. This is figure 210 and look, it looks good for Minnesota. You're stable at 2C and 3C. So you're not gonna expect a further huge changes in weather patterns. You're looking at up to 10% more precipitation. More precipitation is gonna help. Let's look at another model. So here's another model. This is figure 4.3. This lets us look at how much more precipitation we expect at 2C and how much. And we can see there's a climb here where there's more rain expected, generally speaking, towards the east than to the west of Minnesota. And we can see some areas that are pocketed where you might expect a bit less or a bit more. You know, that can be good or bad. 
getting more rain, right? It all depends on how it falls. Let's look at figure 2.12 to get a hint about if this is going to be a gentle rain or like a big deluge, this increased rain. Okay, I know this figure is big and crazy. What I do is I look over these three different models to see where there's repeating patterns. And in Minnesota, I do see important repeating patterns. We'll zoom in. So these high intensity areas, these are significant. That's where you expect to see big deluge type storms with maybe 15, maybe 20% more water. This line of storms here on the Iowa border, particularly a little bit south of the Iowa border, we're getting more of it than you are. We do expect an intense line of storms. And it's worth noting that up there, up by the Mississippi headwaters in the reservation lands, we also see a threat emerging, not so much of the fire like we saw there, but a threat of water, a threat of deluge. As we think about deluge in Minnesota, I think it's important to think about the rivers. And this is an extremely simplified map because Minnesota, people outside of your state aren't gonna be able to handle how many rivers you have. You're gonna break their minds. But I wanna pull in this reality that as we're talking about deluge type rains up in this quarter here, we're talking about deluge type rains up at the top of the Mississippi River, meaning that that deluge is gonna drive riverine flooding down river for a good ways. And as we look here, as we look at a line of storms here, again, potential deluge focusing in the Mississippi watershed driving riverine flooding way downstream through the region. So I think that's important to think about as you're thinking about getting ready in Minnesota is that as we see some deluge type storms emerging within the watershed, we have to think about flooding moving downstream. And I think thinking about those change bands, it's also nice to check back in on the sweet spot because look, it's so cute. It looks just like my house. You know, this lighter color, we're forecast at my house, and over here to get more rain. But mathematically, if it's not going to be increasing in intensity, that suggests to me that these are two little pockets in the country where we're looking at more of a return to normal-ish rain patterns, to more frequent, lower intensity, gentle rains. That's a wonderful thing to see. Very rare the lineup of factors that we see in this precious band in Minnesota. And if I wanted to go to a city in Minnesota that was likely to stay the most like itself, climate-wise, I'd go to Brainerd and I'd buy in well away from the river. Except for riverine flooding potential, it looks so boring in Brainerd. And that's the best thing I think you could possibly be in this future we're looking towards. Boring is like where we want to be in the Midwest anyway. So I think this is a really great outlook for us. Let's look at the water a little bit more. I want to look at your aquifers. All right, here's figure 24.12 map of the U.S. aquifers. And we can see that there's really variable aquifers underlying Minnesota. It looks like there's good groundwater coverage by Minneapolis. You know, a lot of young people are moving to the Twin Cities, and that's smart. Throughout the southern band there in Minnesota, which is higher change, but honestly, it's going to probably open up some agricultural potential for the farmers there. You've got good aquifers throughout that southern band. So you have a good ability to think long-term about water, think long-term about monitoring recharge, about responsible aquifer use. Responsible use of an aquifer can get you through a long drought sustainably. That's a nice overall ag outlook for much of that southern band of Minnesota, particularly as you get above that projected line of storms that's most strong just below the border in Iowa. Some aquifers up in that middle band, up in the sweet spot, but not too many of them which I like. You know, there's a lot of surface water, of course, all through Minnesota. But one of the other things that I like the most about that low change middle band is that the lack of aquifers means there's not as much potential for development. I think that's ideal. A normal, boring place without too much potential. I think that's perfect. This is another level of challenge, though, up north, you see. You can see that as we head up north, the aquifer coverage is very limited. This means that if you're in the reservation lands where we see that deluge hotspot up by the Mississippi headwater, you might want to do a weird thing. You might want to think about water capture as an important part of your community resilience building. You know, you're looking at getting these big storms. You want to have a way to hold on to that water if there's a drought. And I know it's a weird thing to say, to think about storing large amounts of water up in northern Minnesota where there's so much surface water normally in that landscape. But those droughts that we are getting sometimes in the Midwest and that we're going to keep getting, they're serious. To minimize fire risk, you're going to want to be able to share water with so much of the landscape as you can. 
And up there, it's a better candidate for tank fed irrigation than groundwater irrigation. If anyone is gonna even out this kind of lumpy looking water picture that we see in that Northwest corner of Minnesota, if anyone's gonna help things get better, it's people. People and how we choose to act as we care for this fragile changing landscape. Minnesota, you know, this is not a bad outlook, but it is an outlook about change. There's that middle band there, that low change band, no big threats on the horizon, you got rivering flooding to manage, you gotta get on top of your zoning to prevent overdevelopment, you're gonna be okay. The Southern band, it's higher change, but you've got a more heat tolerant landscape and you've got water and we can identify where you're gonna have increased energy demand from the summer heat. Minneapolis is gonna feel a lot more like Des Moines. And I know that probably grosses you out a little Minnesota, but you're gonna be okay, Des Moines is okay. And even with more humidity in the summer, you can still be cooler in Des Moines in the ways that really matter, like having really good public transportation. The higher change band in the north, you're going to need to be resilient to get through. Pro tip, buying a second home in climate-proof Duluth and managing it as an Airbnb is not a resilient strategy. If you want to be a property investor in Minnesota, the smart move is to focus on the Twin Cities. Property investors who want to focus on resilience, Imagine if you were providing affordable housing for young people getting established, you could do some good in the community. We got a lot of people heading to the Twins who are not ready to buy, and that property value is going to go up. You don't need to squeeze the heck out of your tenants with rent to get your take in the game if you hold for 5, 10 years. Within the Northern Band, we really see the threats emerging. Over on that northwest corner up in the headwaters where there's all the reservation lands, I would think resilience, I would think change. But I also think there's value in being just high enough change that people might leave you alone in peace. I tell you, that's what I hope for you over there because you got enough work to do. Over by Duluth, though, you know, over up around the lake, even by Ashland in Wisconsin, I have a lot of concern there. I'm worried about you folks there. I'm worried that your potential is being exploited, and I'm worried that your threat of fire isn't being taken seriously. I think it's very important to get fire aware and activate it in your communities around the lake up in the north there. I've got one more warning for you, and this is about summer heat. You know, it's a threat in our region that some years, not every year, but some years in the future, we could be getting big heat dumps. And we had one before in, in memory. We had it in the Dust Bowl in the 30s. That heat dome, it got up to 109 in Duluth, and people died. It would not be impossible for us to get a heat dome like that over the Midwest again. Even this summer, I see a lot of soil up in the air which uh, my ancestors who lived through the Dust Bowl, my great grandmother, she would tell me when I was little about how the dust looked in the air that spring and it looks like that now. I hope it doesn't happen, but we could have a big heat dome this summer. Have an idea just in case of where you would go, what you would take and what you would drink if utilities went out during a heat disaster. You know, a big heat dome, it's the kind of thing we might have to weather hard, weird conditions for a few days here in the Midwest, but it wouldn't go on forever we could make it through. And it's the sort of potential emergency, a heat dome emergency, where we can keep folks alive if we have a plan. And the plan doesn't have to be complicated. You gotta find a safe underground space that you could go to, and you gotta bring enough water for yourself and your family. And then you'll be okay. So don't give up, Minnesota. Don't give up. We gotta get through these fires. They're coming and we'll get through them. We need to be resilient, not just in our homes or in our landscape management, but in our hearts. The changes that are coming will hurt but these landscapes need people to care for them, to help new life attach. These landscapes need people who know how the pieces fit together. People can help and people can learn how to help. In closing, if you're a young person who wants an urban center that's a good climate destination, go to the Twin Cities. End of story, they're the best choice in the country. If you're a person looking for a small town for a traditional Midwestern feel, there are going to be many great places with different vibes in that middle band and in the southern band. And we need to support our friends in northern Minnesota. They're standing on the front lines of change. They're facing threats from fire and water in a rapidly changing landscape where the loss of cold means a lot of loss. But we can prepare for what's coming. Minnesota, let's get ready. So this is a story in honor of uh, Mr. Paul Rock Kretsch. I thought about him a lot when I made this video. He died in 2013, which is too young. He died at age 51. And I think it's an indictment of our society that so many of our indigenous leaders 
don't live to become our indigenous elders, because it's a loss to all of us that Mr. Kretsch is not one of our elders now. He took care of me around 2009, 2010, as part of his work as a counselor at Arizona State University. And I think that in many ways, that was meaningful work for him, but kind of like his day job. He did a lot of work in uh, cultural revival. He published a uh, really interesting work on uh, revitalizing indigenous men and reconnecting indigenous men both to a healthy masculinity and to cultural roles. He is uh, in recordings in the MIM, the International Music Museum, because of his work with drum circle revitalization. And he is wonderful with the drum circle work, wonderful voice, wonderful drummer. He is an inspiring person to so many people. And he had a huge impact on my life, more than I can ever repay. He took care of me when I had um, survived an attempt on my life. Someone I loved to tried to kill me, so I was pretty messed up. I was assigned to him when I went back to counseling. That was how I met him. And he did a lot to help me. And when I ran out of the a number of sessions that my insurance would pay for, I told him about this. And I was like pretty happy about it because the work we were doing was so hard that I didn't want to keep doing it. And he told me, no, I'm not done with you yet. And he kept treating me. He worked with me for a long time, even though I don't think that he was getting paid for it. And even though he was sick, he was very sick at the time with uh, what killed him. And he was in pain from this liver sickness. He was in a lot of pain from it at the time that he was treating me. But uh, he kept to give to the world. He kept, you know, trying to do the work of life, the work of reinvigoration, the work of restoration. And I've been very moved by his work, both in the lasting improvement and healing that he gave to my deep wounds. Uh, one of the great teachers in my life, man. But also he taught me to look beyond the trade for money and look for the trade for life. Mr. Kretsch, he loved his family. He loved his people very much. You know, I made this video in such a way, I hoped it would be helpful for people in the Ojibwe and other Anishinaabe communities in the forecast area in Minnesota. If uh, any of you reach out to me and want to share a story of Mr. Kretsch, that guy was the best. And if there's anything that I can do for his tribe in the Ojibwe Nation, reach out to me. I don't want to trade for money. I do anything I can to help you in the trade for life.